Thanks everybody for being on today. We're really excited to talk to you all about digital inclusion. This is the uh, sixth broadband boot camp brought to you all by uh, the Center on Rural Innovation and the Appalachian Regional Commission in partnership for the National Broadband Resource Hub. So if y'all are not familiar with what the National Broadband Resource Hub is, uh, we'll drop a link in the chat box towards the end of this presentation that can give you access to it, can have you sign up on it, um, and really get connected with a group of broadband experts and folks around the country that are also trying to solve the world's greatest problems, just like you are right now. Uh, today with us, we have myself. I'm a broadband analyst for the Center on Rural Innovation. Um, Jane Woodson is also on the call today. She's also a broadband analyst with our organization. And then Curtis Hansen, right? Program manager for the ARC. All of y'all might be tired of seeing Curtis's face by now. Who knows? Um, I'm just kidding, Curtis. But thank you for being on today and joining us and all the work that you do throughout the ARC region. We really appreciate it. So setting the stage, we're going to talk a little bit about digital inclusion, digital equity. Um, we all know that Appalachia has had historic um, underinvestment, I would say, in broadband access, but specifically when we're talking about not just access to the internet, but also affordability, also when it comes into play with access to devices. When we think about actual digital equity at the end of the day, Appalachia has a long way to go in really propelling um, these the factors of the next phase of broadband really forward. And we all know that it really Im impacts, honestly, the quality of life that people have in communities when they have better access to the internet, but also that it's affordable, that you can actually pay to have access to that internet, and then also that you have the devices to it as well. So we're going to address the question questions throughout this today of what is digital equity, what do the impacts of digital equity mean for communities, and how does a community really make a digital equity plan? And I'm going to pass it over to Jane to go over some of the key barriers and terms that y'all are going to see throughout this. Awesome. Thank you, Anderson. Uh, yep. So as she said, we are going to dive into some key terms before we get into more of a problem-solving brainstorming discussion. Um, first, we'll start with the digital divide, and that is the problem that we are addressing. You may have heard this term um, uh, in a everyday conversation about broadband or in funding conversation specifically. This is the gap between those who have access to the internet and know how to use it and those who do not. Communities and organizations all over the US are working to solve this issue, and that work is called digital inclusion. That's the process by which we close that digital divide. Um, and our goal is digital equity. A digitally equitable community is one in which everyone has equal access to the opportunities that are provided by broadband connectivity. Um, and we'll talk about more specifically the opportunities that broadband brings to a community uh, in a bit. We are focusing on three that community leaders, um, three contributing factors to the digital divide that community leaders can start addressing today. In a digitally equitable society, people need three things, access to the internet, devices that enable them to access the internet, advantage of it. Next slide. Why is digital equity important? Um, so I'm sure that we all have seen personally or know people who have been affected by poor connectivity, especially during the pandemic, um, or maybe you've read news articles about school kids having to go to stores and, and fast food restaurant parking lots to um, attend class because they didn't have internet at home during online um, schooling. And the point is that it impacts communities at every single level. It's all around us. Um, it's in every aspect of our society. It affects economic health, it affects job growth, educational opportunities, um, telemedicine or telehealth, everything. And there's growing evidence that working to close the digital divide has a real massive impact on communities. Uh, for example, the US Chamber of Commerce uh, predicts that the full adoption of digital tools by small businesses in rural areas in the US would add more than 300,000 jobs. And also better internet access has been linked in many studies over many years to um, higher graduation rates, higher grades in K through 12, um, lower rehospitalization for medical patients, lower medical bills, and so on and so on. Um, keep in mind that just building better broadband infrastructure 
um, and building networks, it doesn't um, completely solve the problem and it doesn't produce these incredible results if broadband adoption doesn't happen as well. So let's return to that other graphic showing the issues that contribute to the digital divide. These issues, access, devices, and knowledge are also key for broadband adoption, which again, we need to strive for if we want to see real impact. The challenge of access to the internet, it can look several different ways. Uh, it can be a lack of infrastructure, a lack of affordable infrastructure, and um, there are several causes. Uh, Underinvestment in low income communities, lack of investment in sparse areas, digital redlining, monopolistic pricing. pricing. Um, there are some solutions that we've seen communities uh, take on as um, a way to solve this problem, and they're really awesome. Public Wi-Fi networks, hotspot lending programs, for uh, usually from community anchor institutions like libraries. Um, there are also there's also the option of subsidy programs for installation fees or monthly service fees. Um, people also face challenges, of course, when it comes to device access. Um, the challenge that they face with devices is. Um, again, can look several different ways. Uh, maybe they don't have a computer or a tablet. Maybe they only have a phone, but they are asked to do digital work um, for you know, their work or for school that requires something more robust than a phone. Um, or maybe they have an old modem that just does not support uh, the current uh, broadband speeds. Some thoughtful solutions for uh, Inaccessible inaccessibility uh, because of devices would be providing affordable or free devices, and we'll talk about some funding programs that can help with that. Uh, device donation and or refurbishment, device lending, and access to devices at libraries. Again, using those community anchor institutions that many of our communities already have in order to solve those gaps. Um, and sometimes the access and the devices are in place and available, uh, but that is not enough to guarantee broadband adoption. People also need to know how to use these tools. Uh, so lack of skills is our last category for the day uh, that strongly impacts uh, digital divides in, in our communities. The lack of skills required to effectively use an internet connection um, inability to apply to jobs, so uploading a PDF resume or doing an interview over Zoom. Sometimes people cannot do that because they've never used these applications before. They just don't have those skills and haven't been taught to them yet. Um, missed telehealth appointments, reduced employment opportunities. And there are some solutions that we can um, look to in order to address um, digital skill gaps. We can do digital skill building classes and digital navigator programs, again, using those institutions that exist in our communities um, where digital knowledge already lives, like libraries and schools. Um, unfortunately, the digital divide may never be solved, even with all of these great solutions. Changing technology means that the digital divide is a moving target. Um, so. In addition to building this future-proof broadband infrastructure that you've probably heard about at this point, um, communities should also focus on future-proof support systems around connectivity. So making sure that um, digital equity isn't just a focus in this period of time or people are seeking funding and building networks, but moving forward it is an integral part of your community and how your community functions. Um, the current broadband planning and funding landscape does give us great opportunities in order to fund digital equity programs. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later today. Um, and that includes BEAD, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. Um, and speaking of broadband planning, I'm going to hand things back over to Anderson so she can walk us through the process of creating a digital equity plan. Cool. Um, thank you so much, Jane. I really appreciate that. Does anyone have any questions just before we go on? I know that 
Jane kind of threw a lot of little um, words at you there when it comes to, to digital equity and inclusion. Hopefully these are things and words that you all have heard already before and kind of throughout your time and process within this work already. Uh, but we did want to give a, a base level for folks just to be able to understand that those three legs of the stool have not always been functioning, particularly in rural, uh, like rural places in rural Appalachia. If you have access to the internet, you haven't always been able to afford it. If you can afford it, you haven't always had the device to be able to use it. And so being able to really see all three sides of that is why um, folks are so keen on it. And I also want to give a big shout out right now to the uh, National Digital Inclusion Alliance. This is the first time that ever um, money has really been given for digital equity. These folks have been advocating for this on behalf of almost 10 years now, a decade long of research and advocacy and work has gone into putting the phrase digital equity into federal funding. And that just happened in the last two and a half years. And so it's a really impactful moment for our community and for our world, if you really think about it as we're going forward into it. So just wanted to put that base level there before we talk about creating a digital equity plan, which is something that all of you should be thinking about in your own backyards right now, if you're not already. Um, and really the great thing about creating a digital equity plan is that the steps are to it are pretty simple. Uh, the actual work itself is what gets complicated, I like to tell people, but bringing folks together is really where you want to start. You know, the first question I always ask anybody when they're asking me about digital equity is, well, you know, does your local municipality or does your county have a broadband working group? Uh, and a lot of people look at me and they go, no, Anderson, they don't. I really don't even know the answer to that question. And so that's your first place to start right here, right now. And especially for folks that are in municipal elected or elected leadership or in municipal governments or in county government leadership positions right now, that should also be your main focus is getting together a group of people that can focus on this full time. Most of what we found from especially rural municipalities right now is the fact that their capacity strapped with all of the federal funding that we're seeing coming down the pipe. Most folks don't know who to turn to or really how to make this happen. And, and that's really where you need to start utilizing your volunteer base in your own community. And so the place to start would be really to get representatives from your various community institutions. Those can be your nonprofit leaders, your churches, um, anybody that you feel like has a stake in wanting to see your community go forward and thrive. Um, that can be your local elected officials, right, too. That should also mean maybe some folks that are just super volunteers in your community that show up every week and do the Meals on Wheels services in your community. Um, but bringing folks that have an interest in ensuring that everybody has internet access together. If you've got a local Facebook group, feel free to throw an interest link in there at some point in time that says, hey, do you care about getting internet access to everybody in our community? And if they do collect sign up forms from that, this community broadband group should really be addressing the questions, you know, who are we leaving behind in our town, in our municipality, or in our county altogether, or just in general in our community. So they can also have a, a useful idea to be able to go in and say qualitative and quantitative data sources that are free for them to use. If you've not already thought about, you know, using community interviews with folks that have already said, we've got internet problems and we know exactly where people are unserved right now or where folks can't afford necessarily to, to bring in internet to their homes, but they have access to it already. Um, American Community Owners Community Survey Data, ACS, has internet or information, my gosh, I'm sorry, internet information already on internet um, access and device ownership. Um, you all, this information is somewhat readily available. You don't have to necessarily go out and be able to collect it automatically because I know that a collection process for this can sometimes seem hard to do too when you're just getting started. So speed test data is also something to utilize when you can look at Ookla online can really show you kind of what they have collected from uh, anyone in your area that's gone online and taken a speed test before. And then also um, we're going to talk a little bit about the affordable connectivity program, the enrollment data for that um, from the FCC. So step two is just really understanding the existing efforts. So once you have that broadband working group together and you're able to, to really address the fact of, you know, where in my community are we struggling with access? Is it just affordability? Is it the actual infrastructure build out of a network not reaching a, a certain part of our community? Or is it the fact that folks can't afford the devices or don't have devices in order to be able to get on the internet with? Um, chances are community institutions are already addressing these problems. Your local library, if you've got a local community college in your backyard, these folks are already thinking about it because they're talking to folks every day that have had to deal with the past two and a half years of not having access um, or not having service and dealing with the struggles of what the pandemic has um, had given on, or given to people in communities. And so broadband working groups um, can really, I think, bring together collaboration from those community institutions. And instead of the silos that we often see in rural areas, but also just in general in communities when it comes to working on this type of stuff, making or type of issues, I mean, but trying to make sure that everybody's working together. 
um, existing digital inclusion work is going to be a community's greatest asset in bringing all of those folks to the table. So in Person County, for an example of this, I live in uh, North Carolina. So Person County is a little tiny county right on the Virginia border. Um, what we've done here, though, is that we have a local residential housing authority that has provided free internet access to all of their residents. They work with Spectrum. They have a contract with them that they utilize and that Spectrum actually came in and installed um, all the access to the residential housing authority uh, res residents for them. And so what they do then is they partnered with our local community college, Piedmont Community College, to have a digital skilling program that one of the professors there and a few of the volunteers from the community college lead um, every week. And they have a program where that you can graduate from the community college to be able to actually have a, uh, a license that says, you know, I'm digitally skilled trained now. And they get a free laptop once they graduate from that program from the local community college so that they can use it and that they can have it back in their own home and that home access that they've got to the Internet. Is what is what is uh, drawing them back into being able to go online to access job opportunities or be able to, you know, make a Facebook account for the first time in their lives. The great thing about the Internet is that you don't want to tell people what you want them to do with it. You want to help them figure out, well, here's everything that you can do with the Internet now once you have access to it. So. Um, step three is just going to be creating and sharing an action oriented plan. We want to be specific about community needs and goals, what's attainable and what's achievable. And one of the reasons why we're not going to tell you what that is in this presentation is because we need you to go out there and figure that out. Honestly, each community is different. And I tell folks, you know, if you've seen one, if you've seen one town, you've seen one town when it comes to broadband access right now, uh, because everywhere is inherently different. And so one of the things that we really want to make sure that folks know is that the ideas are there, the people are there, we need someone to corral everybody together and bring them together to find out what is the call to action for greater community involvement look like around broadband? What are the structures for training volunteers and increasing the reach of advocates in your community around digital equity? How do you evaluate the short and long-term funding sources for this? And that can be everything from what we're about to talk about here in the next section with uh, the federal funding that's coming down. But I've also seen some really creative folks go in and be able to advocate to their local city councils and county commissions about getting seed funding in their county budgets right now um, for digital equity. And we are going through budget processes for anybody that doesn't know what's happening in local governments at this moment in time. I'm sure all of you do, but budget planning is really a cool part, but it's also something where I think that we can get more advocates that are uh, digital equity advocates interested in that process for, at the local level. We can really make headways with digital equity, not just coming from the federal level down, but from the local level up, which I think would be awesome. Um, so every organization that has a role to play, whether that be your school systems, your libraries, your nonprofits, your churches, even in your community, thinking about how, having to integrate them into this process, too, I think would be a huge benefit um, to any local community that's trying to fill a need right now, um, especially in rural places. I grew up in a rural area, and I know that uh, our churches are kind of what took over at one point in time of being a place of help for anybody in a community. So thinking about how you utilize those resources more so, and as Jane also said earlier, or community anchor institutions too. And step four is funding the plan, which sounds a whole heck of a lot easier than it actually is sometimes, I realize for folks on this call. But one of the things that I want to challenge people to do is really look at some of the um, creative ways to look at funding for this, which would be looking at philanthropic institutions and organizations in your community. Are there any um, you know, larger um, philanthropies that might have an interest in giving money to something like this, particularly when we're thinking about uh, the, in, the you know, example that Jane gave earlier of school-age kids having to drive to a bus that had a mobile hotspot in it and sit there all day long and, and hand in homework like that. Um, you know, thinking about United Way chapters, um, we even have a community bank in Person County. It's called Roxborough Savings. And Roxborough Savings has done a lot to invest in the community in this regard by helping provide free devices to um, our, our public school systems and also really becoming part of that anchor institution process too. And so looking at ways where you can grab people in that just have an interest in this. Also state and federal grants, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And then um, budget allocations for the municipality. Like I said, we've had some interesting communities that have gathered from their city council budgets or their county um, county commissioner, county budgets from their county commissioners this year that have gotten good allocations. And then also mission aligned practitioners, your senior centers, libraries, nonprofits, like I said, those are the places where people that are impacted by this are really going to be trying to get help from too. ISPs may also contribute. Um, I know we've not really talked about providers and their role in this so far yet, uh, much at all, but I do believe that 
providers have a huge responsibility and role to play in helping solve this problem in a community. And they also want to be a part of it. And I think that when you have a local ISP and also someone that is willing to really maybe pitch in on um, a, a, you know, the uh, establishing an opt-in surcharge, I'm sorry, and then on a broadband service and also potentially like matching maybe some of the things that a community is able to provide when you're looking at broadband funding, it could just be an interesting conversation to have with them and to broach with them about where you're seeing the um, problems with access, affordability, and device availability too in that sense. Um, Long-term sustainable funding is the goal for any type of initiative that someone has in a rural area and particularly in Appalachia right now. It can be hard to find funding for something like this when you're also trying to find funding for just keeping your water supply up and, and clean and running sometimes. So I fully understand that people are dealing with the resource strapped capacities here and thinking about creative places, like I said, philanthropies, but also where you can go in of like your community anchor institutions and find people that have an interest in this and a stake in it going forward. And step five is just executing and organizing more support. Uh, I tell people all the time, communities can't do this without volunteer capacity from folks on the ground. And there's a lot of people who are, are ready to utilize the energy they have after having to go through what we've been through in the last three years of, of lack of access. And I think that, you know, empowering people to take advantage of digital inclusion resources and to pass that information along to others. Jane mentioned earlier a program called the Digital Navigators. That's something that came out of the NDIA, which is an amazing program when you think about it. Digital Navigators essentially is creating a um, program where folks that have had problems figuring out how to access the internet or how to use it before are also then the people that go in and train other folks to do that too. So in North Carolina, where I live, Charlotte, one of our major metropolitan areas has a office of digital navigators now. And it's run by folks who have called um, the digital equity office in Charlotte before and asked them, you know, how do I, how do I file? How do I put in a job application online? I've got no idea. And it's folks that have actually called through that system. When I tell folks about the Digital Navigators program, and once again, shout out to the NDIA for crafting that program originally to begin with. But when I tell folks about that, people look at me and they go, Anderson, how do you put that into a rural concept? How do we talk about, you know, when you, you may not have a community that has the money to put towards a whole department or a whole entity towards that? And I think it really is about bringing in volunteer capacity to do some of those things. So how do you have maybe a volunteer hotline that's run by, uh, you know, your broadband working group in your community that can have a hotline where people can call in and ask questions about this too, or folks can be able to send in and, and maybe you have working broadband hours sometimes at the local library that every Sunday, someone from your broadband working group is going to be there from two to five. And you advertise that every week in the newspaper or, or every week on the radio station and really get folks to understand that. This is about the community, it's about building each other up, and it's about making broadband access equitable, but also getting more people to talk about how it's not right now, too. Um, so publicizing any successes that you may have, if you get that broadband working group up and going, I hope you publicize the heck out of it in your local newspaper and everything else, too. Um, and also the subsequent work that they end up figuring out how to, to reach the problems and really um, focal point on the needs that need to be addressed in your community. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about opportunities and federal funding, and then we're going to have just some open conversation, open dialogue about the things that y'all are seeing in your community when it comes to uh, digital equity and what you're working on right now, and also maybe about affordability and how you're tackling that in your community too. So the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act obviously had, as I said earlier, um, the NDIA, this is the first time that we've ever had federal funding geared towards digital equity in, in history. And part of that comes from the fact that we now have $42 billion for broadband equity access and deployment, which is really focusing on that last word to their deployment and getting broadband out to folks and making sure that it is accessible in areas like Appalachia. Um, and then also you have the Digital Equity Act, which is digital inclusion and equity projects, the $2.7 billion for um, states to utilize for digital equity programming. And then also a part of that is the Affordable Connectivity Program, the $14.2 billion that is $30 off a month of any um, person's internet bill that makes 200% below the poverty line in the United States. So to dive in a little bit to the Affordable Connectivity Program, um, it's $14.2 billion with no end date. 
One of the things that I have heard a lot of people say about this is, you know, Anderson, what happens after a reallocation of what happens after the money runs out, basically? And what does this reallocation look like for that? Um, we are really pushing the ACP. And so is everyone, like every nonprofit that I've talked to is really pushing the Affordable Connectivity Program because we want to make sure it gets reallocated. And part of that is ensuring that we have like folks signed up to use it. And so um, it does provide a one-time $100 discount for any household to purchase a computer or, or tablet from if that is a participating provider. There is a great website. I'll also drop that link here in the chat box too afterwards where the uh, federal government has made it easier for folks to go on there and find out, you know, do, do I have a, a provider in the, in the, you know, five mile radius of me that can provide the ACP that, that takes the ACP basically. Some providers don't actually take the affordable connectivity program. It's something that um, I really want folks to focus on too, especially if you're in a rural area, because sometimes providers don't are not a part of the or participating in the ACP because they just don't know about it. And if they don't know about it or they don't know how to actually how easy it is sometimes to get signed up and fill out the form. And it's really encouraging when they have folks in their own communities that are coming to them saying, hey, um, you know, my local ISP, we'd really love for you to participate in the affordable connectivity program. Here's how many people are not participating in it in our community that could be right now um, or that could have access to the Internet um, if, if you were participating in it, because it would lower our, our Internet bills by this much a month. So it's, it's always worth asking if you have a provider in your area that's not offering the affordable connectivity program, why are you not? And, and can we help you? And can we push you to do that next time? Um, I, so with B, the, the, real, the real tricky part here is that actually since this bill was passed in 2021, no federal funding has actually hit states yet, uh, which is kind of the hard part, I think, for folks on the ground to realize sometimes. States had to submit a letter of intent to the NTIA to be part of uh, the planning process and actually start to receive their uh, digital equity funding. No state knows exactly how much they're going to be allocated out from that $2.7 billion of the Digital Equity Plan Act that we were talking about earlier. And so right now, the reason why we say it's so important for communities to be planning and participating in a digital equity plan is that eventually your state is going to come to each community and ask you, have you already thought about this or are you thinking about it? And it's going to be really awesome when communities can look at a state and say, yes, we already know in our area, here's where folks are having issues and here's what we would want to be able to apply for a state grant for with digital equity, because we already know where the gaps are in our own communities. Um, communities that have already gone ahead and assessed their digital equity needs know this now before money hits states are going to be more prepared and inherently have an easier time fil like filtering in um, to what the state is going to bring out for digital equity plans. Each state is going to have their own requirements. They are allowed to do that with digital equity planning. And so right now there is also a, um, a process that you, which you could go through to connect with your state broadband office just to be able to ensure that you have that relation with, relationship with them early on um, for planning of these funds as well. Curtis, do you have anything to add to that right now that folks should be thinking about with state funding? I mean, like you said, I think that we still need to find out a lot about the specifics of what those programs are going to look like. I know that right now there are a lot of listening sessions going on in a couple of the different states. Those are starting to get uh, publicized. Um, so pay attention to your state broadband office who will be pub. Uh, you know, raising awareness for those sessions, those are really going to help you understand the opportunities. I think they're also going to help you uh, start to build a relationship with the state broadband office. If you don't have one yet, you're going to really want to make sure that you know who those people are and you're subscribed to their newsletters and you're up to date on all of their information because they have the money and, and uh, your success is their success. And so they're eager to help train you up and make sure that you're going to be um, uh, entering their program with application successfully. So the best time to get started is now. Yeah, thanks, Curtis. But I know that's kind of confusing because the IIJ got passed in 2021 and we might not see the effects of that money or the actual rollout of that money until the end of 2024. And so um, sometimes that's really hard for people to kind of realize, but I think that that's one of the biggest things we need to be also explaining to our communities right now, to our local electeds in any place right now too, and also to the people on the ground in our communities so that we have time to be able to plan for this and we should be doing it right now. 
So just some discussion questions. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested to hear from people because we've talked a little bit about affordability. And to be honest with folks, I think one of the big questions that some people have right now is just, you know, if the if your provider is not offering the ACP, how are we talking about internet affordability? And what can that really look like? And actually part of what's been put into um, and what states can actually put into the um, planning process for the, their digital equity grants is a low tier for anyone that actually ends up receiving bead funding from the state that they, they could require um, certain applicants or ISPs to actually have a lower tier of um, service coverage, basically, for funding. And so even thinking about advocating right now to your broadband offices about what you would like to see with affordability. But I just know it's a huge question on people's minds. And I, I also don't know if anyone has any ideas on this call to just problem solve with that. But uh, I'd love to, to hear from folks or if y'all have got questions for us right now. And Curtis, if you have any other thoughts on affordability or what just in, in the ARC region might be doing around it right now, too, I uh, would love to have you jump in on that. Oh, I do. Um, <laughs> so we just got like literally yesterday, got a report back from the ARC research team on kind of the county by county report card for how Appalachia is doing with the affordable connectivity program. And I'm going to share a couple of things. Oh, am I allowed to share? Oh, mm. I wonder if I can. Make a co-host. If it works, it works. Otherwise, I can just. I just made you a co-host, Curtis. Try it now. Okay. Wow, look at me. <laughs> oh, look okay. at that. So this is the report, right? It's pretty technical. They went in and they pulled um, from USAC. They pulled out the number of subscribers per county. Uh, and the most recent data when they looked at this was at the end of February, so March 1st. Uh, then they looked at the level of poverty uh, using the federal federally defined poverty thresholds. And this specifically that 200% of the poverty level is an eligibility criteria for ACP. So we said, okay, if this is the percentage of people uh, in, of homes in that county that are at that poverty level, there's at least that many homes that are eligible for ACP. Uh, so then when you do the math on households and percentage of households that are eligible and the number of subscribers that they have there, you can estimate the level of participation for those folks who probably are eligible. Uh, so when you look at ARC around uh, the whole region, there are some counties that are doing a great job. So here we think there's 68% of the people who are eligible are participating. And let's even sort this. So, wow, Eastern Kentucky is doing great. And I, you know, probably credit that to the local leaders there, maybe to the ISPs for being more proactive. Uh, but then you go down the list and there are some counties that for whatever reason uh, have a lot of work to do. And keep in mind that some of this might be that homes that are eligible just don't have access to broadband. That could be the case, right? They go to sign up and the ISP says, guess what? You don't have uh, infrastructure nearby that'll support this. Um, but I think this is great data. They also built some maps. So this was the map where we looked at from the last time they pulled the report, which was nine months prior in May to February, uh, where have we seen the most improvement? So they said in terms of the number of subscribers, where have we seen the highest percentage change uh, in, at the county level of people participating in ACP? And, you know, again, there are some hot spots. I think uh, we did a, a, a road trip last fall with the FCC and met with local leaders to try to build awareness and, and uh, help people build outreach programs around ACP that ran through this corridor. Uh, from Maryland into uh, Ohio. I know the southern tier of New York has been doing a lot of work. So you do start to see progress from organizations and from groups that have started to pay attention to this. Uh, and it's not rocket science. I think we talked a lot about some of the options already. Uh, one of the things that I worked with Anderson on last year was building a toolkit, right? A very basic toolkit uh, we published it on our website, and this is some of the lessons we learned on that road trip. We said, how do you go about increasing awareness and increasing participation rates in ACP? So that link has some additional resources on how you can go about doing that. Um, another thing, next week, uh, if you're interested, ARC is hosting uh, what they're calling a virtual roadshow. Uh, this is the 
I think the fourth stop on their roadshow, each stop has been highlighting a different ARC investment area. Next week is infrastructure. And broadband has been, you know, we're part of the infrastructure team here at ARC. So we'll be having a panel uh, during the session and you can come learn more about some of the things that other folks are doing around not just the physical infrastructure, but some of that non-physical infrastructure that Jane talked about. It's systems that help people access affordability programs. It's, it's programs that help people develop uh, digital literacy skills, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we're going to be talking all about that. I'll get a link for that and drop that in the chat as well. I'd encourage you to attend. It's going to be, I think it's like a multi-hour event. We're just one panel later in the session, but it should let you know if you register kind of when to pop in. Cool. Thanks, Curtis. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we got a really good question in the chat um, from Lonnie uh, from Tennessee. Is there a way the public can advocate for increased broadband access for themselves? Yeah, Lonnie, I'd say one of the best things and and just getting to your getting to a city council or county commissioner meeting and and honestly being able to figure out what's your local government right now doing to address both of those like both the issues of broadband access but also deployment. Every community should be working on it right now in some regard. Uh, the Affordable Connect or um, the American Rescue Plan, uh, ARPA funds that just got released uh, last year were the of um, starting point, I would say, to thinking about broadband, broadband funding. And so American Rescue Plans that, or American Rescue Plan dollars that got introduced to each municipality and county. Some municipalities use that money to do other things than broadband access. It's not always guaranteed that that's what they did with it, but it's a good thing to go back and ask. And um, also thinking about the fact that we are going to be getting bead money coming down the pipe to local communities, um, addressing that now and figuring out how your local government is interacting with that. Um, what's interesting about this money and about the American Rescue Plan dollars and both bead is that they are directly going to hit communities at some point in time. It may be a little bit longer time than we meant for it to, but um, what's happened in previous terms, though, is that it's only been it's only been stopped at states, basically, and states have been able to um, really determine what happens. And I think communities right now have a big impact in being able to say, this is what we want to see from what you're going to allocate out to us and how you're going to be allocating out that grant money at the end of the day. So um, getting to city council meetings, getting to county commissioner meetings, that broadband working group, when I talked about that originally too, that's supposed to be a way of, for a community to gather together and rally together and try to advocate um, for better broadband and better uh, internet access, I mean, across your community. The things that I've seen really well work for broadband working groups is when they've actually been established and recognized through a local city council or through a local, local county commission. It depends on how friendly they are to you. I'll be honest with you. There are some municipalities and some local governments right now that just do not want to pick this torch up and run with it. I am not really sure why, but we're trying to bring them along and bring them up to speed with stuff because we know, as Jane was talking about earlier, the benefits of this are tenfold for the quality of life that, of people that live in, the, in your community. Um, but I'd love to know, Lonnie, do you have any other like follow-up questions to that or any things like specifically, how do you get that started, Anderson? Like, I, I'll be honest with you, Person County, where I'm from, it's got a it's got a Facebook group called Person County Local in it. And there's around 10,000 people that are in my county that reside there. And all I had to do was go on there and say, who's interested in helping get us better broadband? And I put a Google form in there and let folks sign up to it. And like, we got a, we got 25 people that, that are on a committee right now that meet monthly to talk about broadband access in our county. And we've been through the county GIS. We've gotten maps of where everything looks like right now. Um, our county GIS is really on board with trying to help us figure this out too, because they get calls and complaints every single week about bad broadband access in the county. Um, so really utilizing that to fuel the fire of it too. I'll add that, um, you know, ARC, a lot of what we've funded historically around broadband has been focused on infrastructure, but we're not limited to funding broadband projects that are focused on infrastructure. We could fund uh, digital equity planning efforts. If you want to work with your local development district or your state ARC program office to put together applications around that, definitely an application that would be uh, high value because it's planning for the future and it's building those sustainable funding sources that you can use to build these programs that'll help people uh, forever. Because we talk a lot about the value of broadband, but 
without these other aspects of that stool, the infrastructure doesn't do anything, right? We, we don't care if there's fiber in your neighborhood if people can't afford it, uh, or if they don't know what to do to get as much value as possible out of it. So we definitely see value in not just the planning, uh, also implementation projects around non-infrastructure parts of broadband would be eligible for ARC funding. Uh, that includes things like digital navigator training programs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're pretty flexible and, and we love to see the creativity that comes out of the region because uh, you all know your community better than we do. And you know uh, what will help make the most impact. So uh, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to give me, uh, you know, drop me a line specifically. I'd love to chat about your ideas. Uh, another option, I think we talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, we did fund a project uh, that's across 12 of our 13 Appalachian states through Connect Humanity. Uh, they're trying to help 50 different communities go through a digital equity planning process that'll end with a very holistic look at uh, how to improve and achieve digital equity in their community. So that's not just the infrastructure, that also includes uh, all those other aspects we talked about today. So if you haven't looked at that yet, go check it out, think about applying and get in touch with the Connect Humanity team. Cool, thanks, Curtis. Yeah, Lonnie, county commissioner meetings can be a fun one sometimes, especially to go up and uh, public comment for. So I'm always a big fan of that. <laughs> um, the other thing that's really neat, I did mention it with the digital navigators program, but actually how that works in Charlotte. So they actually have a hotline with the um, local county police or sheriff's department there. So like you can call, um, it's like 311 is the line. And like, that's how they do their digital navigator program. And for me, I'm kind of thinking about that, even in a rural county, you could still have something like that, like your sheriff's department would still be willing to help create a hotline potentially for something like that. If your broadband working group wanted to be the one on the back end answering that, um, it definitely can be too. But just thinking about like creative ways to help address the problems of why people don't maybe access the internet right now. And to quote a good old Doug Dawson, if any of you are big fans of a uh, pots and pans blog. If you're not, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a good, I, I see some folks saying like, what is that Anderson? I'll drop it in the chat box for you. Um, but Doug is, is a great blogger, but he posts about things that are really relevant right now going on in broadband spaces. But Doug's big thing right now is like, you know, the next phase of broadband really is one-on-one. -on -one. And with technology and how it changes, it's always going to be us having to, to constantly bring each other up to speed and teach each other on, on how to do this. And so really rallying around your community and figuring out a way to bring in more volunteers and more people to help solve that problem with you. That's so true. It's uh, forever broadband. Uh, you know, the digital divide has been an infrastructure problem, which is a funding problem. Um, but we're looking towards a horizon where that's not the case. It is, it's messier. It's more person to person. I think that uh, it's going to take a lot more people focusing on the problem than it did before. Yeah. And that's kind of the reality. So all of you on this call today are taking the first step in doing that. I know that uh, the words of, of or in the frame and just everything that includes in broadband, I tell folks all the time, no one expects you to be an expert about it right now. No one expects you to know every single piece of the puzzle that you're trying to work out or work on because it is ever changing. And it's something that it's a new phase of kind of a, a social justice issue to some degree that people are really working on trying to figure out right now because we haven't been confronted with it. I used to tell people all the time, in a rural area where I'm from, I used to always think I deserved bad internet because like you choose <laughs> to live in an area where like you're going to have it. And and now folks are looking at you going, no, that's not true. Actually, everyone deserves to have access to it. And I think that the framing of that is something that we could really be delivering to people everywhere right now and, and trying to reframe people's um, minds on how we even think about what we should and should not have access to as human beings. So I just thought it was kind of neat. And I think that the whole concept of digital equity and what you all are trying to do right now and learn from is really, really important for the future. Any other questions though? While I get philosophical and on a little soapbox <laughs> here, I don't know. Um, any other thoughts or folks want to talk about affordability or things like that? Anybody have any good ideas, just things they're working on right now? You got Curtis on here. I mean, I'd take advantage of asking some questions to the to him if if, if you do. <laughs> um, but if not, that's A-OK -okay too. And um, we'll hang out on this call for just a little bit longer if folks don't have any. Yeah, I would love, I would love the uh, groundswell of demand for digital equity funding at ARC to prompt the separation of broadband from the infrastructure team. 
because you know again it's been a money problem and infrastructure for so long it should be a workforce development a business and community development problem as well so please if you have questions send them in uh let's get a bunch of grant applications and see if we can do something cool at arc yeah cool thanks curtis thanks everybody for hopping on us like i said jane curtis and i'll be on here for a little bit longer but I um, really appreciate everybody. And don't forget next week, we have one last broadband boot camp that we're offering. It is just a free for all. Um, you can come in and ask us any questions that you all have. Um, it'll just kind of be like a, a little work session. So, so feel free to hang out, y'all. Come by. <laughs>